All righty. It looks like we have a, a good group coming in, so I'm going to get us started. We have a lot to talk about today. So good morning, everyone. My name is Hannah Fuller. I'm a media officer with the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Thank you for joining us this morning for a webinar on the report released last week titled, the Evalu titled Evaluating Impacts of Offshore Wind Energy on Nantucket Shoals Region Ecosystems, Hydrodynamics, and Whales. You can download a copy of the report and other supporting materials at www.nap.edu. A recording of this webinar will be available in the coming weeks on the National Academies website. For those of you not familiar with the U.S. National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, we are private nonprofit institutions that provide independent objective analysis and advice to the U.S. to solve complex problems and inform public policy decisions related to science, technology, and medicine. For each requested study, panel members are chosen for their expertise and experience and serve pro bono to carry out the study's statement of task. The reports that result from the study represent the consensus view of the committee and must undergo external peer review before they are released, as did this report. We have members of the committee with us here today to discuss the report, before I turn it over to them, I want to go over a few reminders. Please note that this webinar is scheduled to last one hour. We'll start off with a presentation summarizing the report, and then we'll open it up to any questions you may have. To ask a question, simply click Q&A at the bottom of your Zoom screen and type in your question. You can submit a question at any time during the presentation, and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. Now I'd like to introduce the members of the committee that wrote the report who will be speaking with us today. First off, Eileen Hoffman is the chair of the committee that wrote the report and is a professor and eminent scholar in the Department of Ocean and Earth Sciences and a member of the Center for Coastal Physical Oceanography, both at Old Dominion University. Jeff Carpenter is a physical oceanographer at the Institute for Coastal Ocean Dynamics at the Helmholtz Centrum Herion in Gestadt, Germany. Jim Chen is a professor of civil and environmental engineering and marine and environmental sciences at Northeastern University. Josh Kohut is a professor in the Department of Marine and Coastal Sciences at Rutgers University. Richard Merrick is an independent marine scientist and former chief science advisor for NOAA Fisheries. Aaron Meyer Gutbrod is an assistant professor in the School of the Ocean, Earth, Ocean, and Environment at the University of South Carolina. Douglas Nowakek is a professor in the Nicholas School of the Environment and Pratt School of Engineering at Duke University, and Kaus Rugu Kumar is a consultant in marine sciences at Integral Consulting Incorporated, an international environmental sciences and engineering company. So we've got a great group of experts with us today, and I will pass it off to Eileen. Take it away. Okay. Um, thank you, Hannah, for the introduction. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this public briefing for the report, Potential Hydrodynamic Impacts of Offshore Wind Development on Nantucket Region Ecology and Evaluation from Wind to Whales. The objective of this briefing is to provide an overview of the study that was done to develop this report and present key recommendations from the report. We should have 20 to 30 minutes at the end of the presentation for questions and discussion. As you just heard, I am joined by several of the committee members for the presentation, and we will welcome your questions at this time. The committee members who are unable to join send their regrets as that they had conflicting uh, obligations. So um, I'll start with some background on the region of interest. This slide shows the Nantucket Shoals region located to the southwest of Cape Cod. Also shown on the slide is the outline of the proposed wind energy lease areas that are planned for installation on this part of the U.S. continental shelf. The colors represent different wind energy projects. This area represents the first large-scale offshore wind farm development in U.S. coastal waters. Not shown here, but most important to the study, is that this is also an area where the critically endangered North Atlantic right whale is found during the winter to spring months. In ensuring environmentally responsible development and operation of offshore wind in this region is the real motivation for this study. 
So the committee was given a statement of tasks that is shown on this slide. The first task is to assess the state of the science on the effects of offshore wind turbines on hydrodynamic processes and the scale of change from the structures relative to that of natural variability. This first task is based on information available in the literature, that is, peer-reviewed scientific report articles and in reports provided in support of developing offshore wind energy. The second task is to use the literature review and information from public gathering sessions to comment on the ability to estimate the extent of perturbations from offshore wind energy structures on the oceanography with emphasis on ecosystem impacts that might affect availability of prey for the North Atlantic right whale. In other words, can the effects be observed? The committee was then asked to evaluate the applicability of models used by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management in environmental impact analyses and studies of wind energy areas in the Nantucket Shoals region. So this task asks, can the effects be modeled and simulated? And finally, the committee was asked to suggest approaches for assessing the hydrodynamic impacts of offshore wind energy structures. Okay, so who took on these tasks? Well, as you heard in Hannah's introduction, we have quite a, a, a nice committee here. The committee members are shown on the slide. And as Hannah mentioned, the committee expertise includes observations and modeling of hydrodynamic processes, atmospheric dynamics, marine mammal ecology and population dynamics, zooplankton population ecology and dynamics, and ecological modeling. The committee also includes expertise from wind farms installed in European waters. All right, and as already mentioned, several of the committee members are participating in this briefing and are available to answer questions at the end. So how is the study done? Well, uh, BOM, the study sponsor, provided a one-year contract to the National Academies that started in March of this year. The National Academy staff organized the committee you saw on the previous slide, and work on the statement of tasks began in April with planning for a public workshop to gather information. The workshop took place in June. There were other in-person meetings of the committee, as well as virtual meetings to discuss conclusions, recommendations, and to write the report. The report was sent for external review in early August, which is less than three months after the first workshop. The committee then responded to the reviewers' comments, which were helpful and insightful. And the result is a peer-reviewed consensus study that was done in about six months. So along with the report, the committee has developed a short highlights document and a one-page summary of the report. And also several conference and meeting presentations are scheduled in the next four to five months. And the first will happen at the end of this month at the North Atlantic Right Whale Consortium annual meeting in Halifax. So I'm going to start by providing a summary of the conclusions from the study. I will then describe the process for reaching these conclusions in addition to providing the committee's recommendation to BOM, NOAA, and others to fill important data and knowledge gaps. So the first conclusion is that the significant natural and anthropogenic variability in the Nantucket Shoals region suggests that perturbations to the hydrodynamics from wind farm development are likely to be difficult to isolate and the effects on zooplankton are likely to be difficult to distinguish. The second conclusion is that significant uncertainties exist in assessing hydrodynamic impacts associated with wind and ocean wakes at local wind farm and regional scales. Uncertainties exist in assessing the abundance and aggregation of zooplankton prey like Calanus marchicus, and uncertainties exist in assessing current and future foraging patterns of North Atlantic right whales. All right, so now we'll look at the report that gives the information that supports the conclusions and recommendations from this study. The report is structured around four chapters. Chapter one provides information about the statement of task in the committee, and we've already talked about that. Chapters two, three, and four consider the oceanography and ecology of the Nantucket Shoals region. 
hydrodynamic impacts of wind farm development, and ecological impacts of wind farm development. So I'll first start with describing the oceanographic regime. All right, as shown in this summary schematic, the hydrodynamics of the Nantucket Shoals region are driven by complex interactions among shelf break processes, seasonal stratification, bottom friction, tides, and flows over complex bathymetry. The complex oceanography is additionally influenced by region specific. Oh, what happened there? Excuse me. By region, um, by region specific processes such as long-term surface densification, onshore midwater intrusions of slope water, warm core rings, onshore displacement of the shelf break front, and interannual and interdecadal variability in the circulation. So a clear result from the literature is that major oceanographic changes have occurred in the region since 2000 and certainly since 2010. These changes include warming of surface and bottom water temperatures, increased frequency of Gulf Stream warm core rings, and midwater intrusions into the tidally mixed inshore region. Warming water temperature affects the onset decay and intensity of seasonal stratification. And these changes affect the oceanography of the region, but the long-term trends and consequences remain to be determined, particularly because the system is continuously evolving. And that's an important point to keep in mind is that this system is evolving in response to all of these different forcing, uh, forcings on it. As shown at the bottom of the schematic, the changes in the oceanography can produce ecosystem responses. Right, chapter two of the report also summarizes information about the biological oceanography of the Nantucket Shoals region, with the main focus being on zooplankton and whales. The North Atlantic right whale shown on this slide and interactions with its prey are the focus for the biological oceanography portion of the report. Right, and this is because the Nantucket Shoals region is an important foraging region for right whales during winter and spring when they migrate to the area. Right whales feed on small, energy-rich zooplankton, and in particular, copepods such as Calanus finmarchicus. And the life cycle of Calanus finmarchicus is showing in the lower, shown in the lower part of this slide. The older copipedid stages, like the C5 stage, and adults are the target prey for right whales. All right, successful foraging depends on the copepod prey being found in sufficient densities and at appropriate depths. This makes the right whale sensitive to disturbances in their prey in the water column. So chapter three of the report provides an assessment of the hydrodynamic impacts that is based on observational and modeling studies. So how is the assessment done? The committee framed its assessment of both the hydrodynamic and ecological effects in chapters three and four around the three scales shown on this slide that represent effects at the wind turbine scale, wind farm scale, and regional scale. The spatial range included in the different scales is shown below each panel here. So what types of effects on the hydrodynamics were considered? Well, this is illustrated using the wind turbine scale figure that is shown here. We first thought about atmospheric effects. As the wind blows across a turbine or a wind farm, wind energy is extracted, creating a wind wake downstream of the turbine with reduced wind speed. This effect is expected at the wind farm scale, but it can be larger depending on atmospheric conditions. In the ocean, the turbine structure in the water column causes an ocean wake meaning that the water becomes more turbulent downstream of the turbine, which is illustrated by the increased number of swirls in the figure. And this effect carries over to the wind farm scale. Increased turbulence and decreased wind forcing both affect the structure and the movement of the water as it passes the turbine. Significant uncertainties exist in understanding these effects. The knowledge we have is limited and primarily based on a few observation and modeling studies done for wind farms in the North Sea. 
The North Sea modeling studies at the wind farm scale have not been generally validated with observations, and there is only one study with transects of stratification across wind farms, and these observations seem to agree with an idealized modeling study. The structure and magnitude of the wind wake at the sea surface is poorly understood, with most observational modeling studies focused on wind speed reductions at hub height of the turbine and not at the sea surface. The effect of ocean surface roughness on wind stress reductions at the sea surface is also poorly understood. So what is the state of being able to estimate the perturbations from wind turbines and wind farms on the hydrodynamic regime? Well, as shown on this slide, at the turbine scale, there are a few observations that can be used to look at wake behavior. Um, but they're, they're, the key thing here is that there are few. The potential effects at the wind farm scale shown on this slide are mostly from limited modeling studies and are not generally grounded in observations. There's only one study with a qualitative a comparison to observations. Hydrodynamic effects at the regional scale are difficult to quantify because of the natural variability. So then the committee also considered the hydrodynamic models that are available for assessing effects at the three scales in the Nantucket Shoals region. This table from our report summarizes the results in terms of model capability that is needed to assess effects at different scales. Idealized models shown here with the blue dots can be applied to assess key processes at all at the various scales. The large eddy simulation, non-hydrostatic models, and the Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equation models can support predictions, but at different scales. The conclusion from this assessment is that a range of models that resolve the appropriate scales are needed to address questions about the effects of wind turbines and wind farms on hydrodynamic processes. So this leads us now to our first conclusion, which is related to observational studies and shown on this slide here. So the, uh, or our first recommendation rather. Observational studies that target processes at the relevant turbine to wind farm scales are needed to isolate, quantify, and characterize hydrodynamic effects. The committee recommends that BOEM, NOAA, and others should promote and require, where possible, these observational studies at all phases of wind energy development, that is surveying, construction, operation, and decommissioning. We also note that the existing wind farms provide opportunities for case studies. The second recommendation shown on this slide focuses on hydrodynamic modeling studies. BOEM, NOAA, and others should require model validation studies to determine the capability and appropriateness of a particular model to simulate key baseline hydrodynamic processes relevant at the turbine, wind farm, and or regional scales. All right. In addition, these studies should evaluate the ability of the model to represent the physical complexity, which was shown on a previous um, slide, evaluate model sensitivity, quantify uncertainty, and evaluate model performance. The last bullet here recommends making the model parameterizations, configurations, and solutions publicly available. And this recommendation comes from the experiences of the ocean and climate communities that show more progress is made more rapidly when a diverse community is involved in model development, implementation, and analysis. Okay, so now we turn to the ecological impacts that are summarized in Chapter 4 of our report. This schematic provides a summary of potential ecological effects. Phytoplankton productivity is primarily controlled by water column stratification and solar radiation. 
zooplankton forage on the phytoplankton that comes that is produced in seasonal blooms, and most higher trophic level species associated with the Nantucket Shoals region feed either directly or indirectly on the zooplankton found in the region. As already mentioned, high concentrations of zooplankton, including Calnus finmarchicus, the primary prey of right whales, may account for the great numbers of um, right whales observed feeding in the Nantucket Shoals region and other areas of high product productivity in southern New England waters. I should mention that Calnus finmarchicus is more likely to be invected into the Nantucket Shoals region area rather than being locally produced, which places emphasis on the circulation. Also, right whales are probably eating other smaller zooplankton as well, and Chapter 2 of the report provides a figure showing what these other potential prey items might be. All right, the concern is the potential for the wind turbines in wind farms to disrupt the abundance and aggregation of the zooplankton, which in turn could disrupt right whale foraging patterns. This figure illustrates the connectivity between the hydrodynamics and calamus. The important message is that calamus is affected by hydrodynamic processes at a range of scales. An implication is that perturbation to the hydrodynamics by wind turbines and wind farms have the potential to potentially disrupt zooplankton availability to the North Atlantic right whale. The paucity of observations and significant natural variability and uncertainty in the modeled hydrodynamic effects of wind energy development at the turbine, wind farm, and regional scales make potential ecological impacts of the turbines difficult to predict and or detect. So what about the effect on the right whale? A summary of the ability to assess these impacts is provided on this slide. Hydrodynamics on zooplankton prey are difficult to assess as shown in the previous slides. We lack understanding um, of foraging by right whales in the Nantucket Shoals region, and studies at a wind farm scale do not adequately capture the right whale's broad use of the Nantucket Shoals region because right whale foraging decisions also depend on the availability or not of prey resources in distant habitats. So this brings us to our third recommendation that deals with oceanographic and ecological observations. And the committee's recommendation is that Baum, NOAA, and others should require collection of oceanographic and ecological observations through a robust integrated monitoring program before and during all phases of wind energy development, that is surveying, construction, operation, and decommissioning. This is especially important as right well use of the Nantucket Shoals region continues to evolve due to oceanographic changes and or the activities and conditions relevant to offshore uh, wind turbines. The related uh, recommendation for oceanographic and ecological modeling is shown here. And while, and again, while wind energy planning and development progresses, Baum, NOAA, and others should require oceanographic and ecological modeling before and during all phases of wind energy development, that is surveying, construction, operation, and decommissioning. And this critical information will help guide regional policies that protect right whales and improve predictions of ecological impacts from wind development at other lease sites. So the key takeaway messages from our report are summarized on this slide. The first deals with uncertainties, which can be, un which can be significant um, uh, that, uh, that are associated with identifying impacts of wind turbines and wind farms on the hydrodynamics, abundance and aggregation of zooplankton, and current and future foraging patterns of right whales. The second message relates to the scale of perturbations from wind tur turbines and wind farms relative to the scale of natural and anthropogenic variability. Perturbations from wind turbines and wind farms may be difficult to isolate from the, these 
uh, significant sources of natural uh, variability. And the third uh, takeaway message here is development of offshore wind should include coordinated regional programs to understand and identify hydrodynamic and ecological effects at turbine and wind farm scales and modeling studies that capture the physical and ecological complexity of the region. All right, so this brings me to our acknowledgements here because there are many people to thank for the support of the study and the report. We thank our sponsor, BOEM. We thank the many volunteers listed on this slide for generously providing their time and expertise that underpin much of our report. We thank the peer reviewers and report review committee for their insightful and critically constructive comments that greatly improved our, the report. We thank Kelly Oscar, our study director, and Safa Wine for their support and guidance that made the report a reality. And finally, I want to thank you for your attention. Um, if you have questions, we'll try to answer them now. And the link at the bottom of the slide, the very long link there, will take you to more detailed information about the study and processes used for the study. So I'll stop at that point. And again, thank you for your attention, and we'll move into Great, thank you so much, Eileen. Um, I'm gonna get us started with our first question. And like Kelly put in the chat, if you have any questions, definitely uh, let us know and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, our first question is, do the potential effects on the North Atlantic right whale warrant pausing further development in the region? Um, no, I think as, as, um, as said here, um, the area, there is significant uncertainty in how, what the perturbations will be and in how the right whales are using the area. But I think what I'll do is I'll ask our right whale experts on the committee, um, Aaron and Doug and Richard, if they would like to expand on that. So please go ahead. Thanks, Eileen. Um, I'll start with saying that that's not that question is not something that our committee was tasked with answering directly. So uh, the the progress of offshore wind is a big question, and it should take into account a lot of things that are far beyond what our committee assessed. Um, but what we can say with some certainty is that climate driven shifts in zooplankton abundance have really dramatically impacted right whale foraging in this region and in other regions that have these um, sort of distant impacts on how they're using this space. Um, so at this point, I don't think there's reason to believe that impacts from offshore wind will occur at the same scale. Um, but it's absolutely, it's understudied. We obviously don't have observations and we don't have models that are capable of answering that question. So this is a great opportunity to dig into this, um, this kind of process and better understand the hydro, hydrodynamic implications of turbines on zooplankton and thus their predators. And, uh, Richard yeah. or Doug, do you want to add to that, please? Yeah, I, well, Aaron covered it very well. Thanks, Aaron. I, the only thing I thought to add is that uh, with this recommendation and the progress of uh, building out um, the first the first wind farms, which are happening now, of course, is our opportunity to do make those measurements, as Aaron said, and allow us to apply those to future developments, um, including the idea of having multiple wind farms in the in the same area. So we're really we're really uh, um, that th they would be great, great measurements to have. That's all. That's all I wanted to add. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, Richard, please. And I think we tend to underestimate what the impact of the changing ocean environment has had on the ecosystems of the southern New England. It's clear for those species that we do monitor, like many of the commercial fish species and shellfish species, that there's been dramatic changes that have occurred since 2000, and particularly since 2010. And we've seen a total collapse of the lobster population. It's, it appears that in the southern New England, the mid-Atlantic, that the scallop stocks are declining. All that is causing the changing ocean conditions, which are also affecting zooplankton, which many of those species would be feeding on. Right. 
Thank okay, you any, any other questions? Yeah, okay. All right, um, our next question is, with the projects that are already in progress in the region, how should these recommendations be implemented? Mm, that's a hard one. I but I think um, that's that's a good question actually. So um, we we did not provide guidance on how to implement our recommendations, but our recommendations do suggest that the existing wind farms could be used as sites to try to develop some of the mon monitoring and measurement programs that could be used to assess uh, impacts. But I'll ask other committee members if they'd like to expand on that. Yeah, please go ahead, Erin. Um, yeah, it, it's a bit of a reiteration of what I just said, but this is a really important opportunity to conduct observations, so sampling, and then also modeling studies. And there's a lot of recommendations in the report about how to think about that. Um, but especially sort of thinking about those three scales, observations and modeling that look at that turbine scale, at the wind farm scale, and the regional scale. And I want to put in a quick plug for uh, regional monitoring programs that exist and that have run for a long time. We're talking about the, in the order of decades. And these monitoring programs have been essential for all of our understanding of oceanography and ecology in the region. So those need to continue. Um, they're not always well supported, so they need to continue being well supported. Um, but we have to add in some sort of high resolution observations and modeling to think about those smaller scales. Right. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay. Great. I'll take us to our next question then. Um, our next question is, if the effects are going to be masked by large signals of climate change, why should funding be allocated to support additional studies and observations? Well, I think the the modeling and observation studies that mostly underpinned our report were done in European waters. All right, so we don't have the equivalent modeling and observation studies for the Nantucket Shoals region area. So it's going to be it's an ongoing process to look at um, to develop the uh, monitoring as Aaron just talked about and observations that will provide guidance on what the impacts will be. But I think, are there other committee members that would like to comment on that? Yes, Josh, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Eileen. I, I think it's a good question. And, and the point that I would raise and, and what we, we speak about in the report is that there is an existing uh, wealth of, of research that's been done in the peer-reviewed literature on natural and climate scale variability of the region. And I'm speaking right now wearing my physical oceanography hat. Um, and so that that was a pretty rich uh, set of literature that we could review as we went in this. So so we have some good uh, good information on that baseline. What's lacking is specific studies to this area. When we look at a wind turbine effect, most of the research that's happened has been based on modeling studies that don't have a lot of observations to support those models. Uh, and so. Uh, you know, it's important for us to understand um, what the scale of impact might be from those models, but make sure we keep it in context with what we do understand pretty well, which is the scale of the natural anthropogenic change. Yeah, thank you. Any other comment from anyone? Okay, yes, Aaron, please go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to add that right whale foraging behavior is really tricky to understand and it's nonlinear. So it seems like there's probably a certain threshold of density that that zooplankton must aggregate in for it to be worthwhile for the whale to forage in that area. Um, so changes that could potentially be of small magnitude can have impacts that are, are hard to sort of suss out. And that's why these kinds of modeling and observational studies are really important. And we have to think on a broader scale, not just in the Nantucket Shoals region, because their choice to use this habitat could actually be based off of something that's happening, you know, in Cape Cod Bay or the Bay of Fundy or even the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. Our, our next question is, 
In the report, there are three hydrodynamic models called out in the committee's statement of task. Um, what would you say is the best for modeling hydrodynamics in the Nantucket Shoals? Okay, so what we point to in our report is that what is needed is a range of models and models that will be able to resolve the appropriate scales for the turbine scale, the wind farm scale, and the regional scale. And that's uh, summarized in the table, that I, uh, that little table with the different colored dots in it. But I, I think that's, we, the it, it really is a matter of, of the scale that the model is looking at. But I'm going to ask um, Jim and Jeff and Kaus, who are the modeling people involved in our committee, if they could respond to that question. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm Jim Chen. Yeah. So um, as uh, Ali said, that we um, the committee look at uh, all models available in the literature in, in, in our disposals, but also the three models that uh, in the task. Uh, Bob want us to examine. So we actually, in, in the report in table one, we listed all the, the characteristics of the models and compare with the reference model and try to show that uh, what's the um, advantage and disadvantage of each model. And it turns out to be there are the fundamental theories and numerical discretization are quite similar, although they are not identical, but one key difference is how you prematurize the small scale uh, effect of the turbine. That's why we look at other LES model, large eddy simulation model, and, and uh, idealized models that, to show that, so, well, you need to take the approach uh, that uh, are corresponding to question related to individuals, uh, the sp specific scale that you want to answer. So uh, we, we don't say which model is the best to me now, is the well, one is the uh, model uh, approach, the model itself, but also how the, the understanding of the uh, the processes in this region. And maybe my colleagues can also add uh, their comments. Yeah. yeah. Jeff, um, yeah. yeah, I think Jim's uh, uh, said it best, actually. Um, I just maybe will quickly add that uh, if you really want to address questions at these different scales, then you do really need a, a different types of models to do that. And there are, and there are existing specialized models to actually uh, go into these different scales and resolve the relevant processes. And when you scale up to regional scales, which, which is a lot of the time what is needed to assess the impacts of these farms, then you really need to get the smaller scales implemented um, and validated in the models. Okay. All right, our next question is, can you comment on the difference in scale between the known impacts of climate change and the potential impact of wind turbines? Oh, that, that's sort of the basis of our report. But, you know, climate climate signals we know are, are happening, I think has already been mentioned. The um, Nantucket Shoals area is really uh, undergoing changes and it's evolving. Um, I don't know that we can say that a uh, give a number or a quantitative answer of the scale of a turbine relative to that, but we think the scale is likely to be small or the response. Um, and that's uh, in several of the conclusions and recommendations, uh, conclusions in our report. But I'll ask other committee members if they would like to try to expand on that. I, yeah, I think it just yeah. uh, from the physical side, um, I, I think it's what, what we've said is that it's important to uh, think of things in context and, and understand that there is significant variability that happens on multiple scales. I encourage the audience, there's, there's, there's quite a few resources for data and analysis of data in the literature that, that helps us scale that variability over a variety of time scales from from events all the way up to climate and multi-decadal scales. And so uh, the report uh, and the consensus of the committee was to make sure that that context is considered when assessing these impacts. Right, yeah, that, that's a good point. It's, it's the context of the impact, yeah, right. Okay. Great. Our next question is, do you think that on-site monitoring 
and use of digital twins for different scenarios would help in impact analysis. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a very good, good question. Um, we we were not tasked with with actually saying what would would be used to assess the impact and in, in at, at this level of uh, being this specific, but you know that would be uh, yeah I mean that that would be a useful way to do this I think yeah for looking at impact analyses yeah I don't know if anybody else wants to say anything to that but but we do recommend that there be monitoring at the level of wind farms and um, and the individual turbines and um, in order to uh, to uh, to assess the inf the effect so yeah but, yeah Richard yeah, please go yeah, ahead I mean, just to to re sort of re repeat your message we had consciously chosen not to try to design a monitoring program we know that there are efforts right now but within NOAA and within yeah. other groups to design such a program, and we wanted to stay out of it other than, other than just to say that it's really needed, a regional coordinated monitoring program. And because you, you need to be able to verify these model results, and you're not going to be able to do it without a good monitoring program. Right. Yeah, that's true. And that that is a strong recommendation that we have made for both the hydrodynamics and the ecology is the need for integrated coordinated monitoring efforts. Yeah. Yes, Kaus, please go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I'll add that, you know, as, as, as the committee has recommended, there's various models on various scales that, that, that need to be validated from the fine scale to the, to the regional scale um, and, uh, and specific site monitoring efforts could help validate uh, the, the, the 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 variety of models on, on on the smaller scales for sure. So 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 I think it's it's a really important component that that needs to be considered. Yeah, yeah. Great, thank you all. Um, our next question is: Can you specifically mention which phases of development the study focused on, or is the study focusing on the effects after the development of the wind turbines? Okay, so the study recommendations focus on things that uh, focus on hydrodynamic and ecological effects that occur through all phases of offshore wind energy development. That's from the planning, the surveying, the development, the installation, and even through decommissioning. So we have not picked out, um, if I understand the question correctly, we are not saying the information we have available to us from the European studies is after the wind farms have been established. But what we're saying is that we need for the recommendation is that we would recommend uh, programs that start at the very beginning of the planning and the development and goes through the whole life cycle of the wind energy development. And I don't think that's been done anywhere, but other perhaps other people can expand on that. Yeah. Yes, Kaus, please go ahead. Oh, so sorry. I, I, I forgot to lower my hand. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. All right, Jeff. <laughs> Yeah, I can maybe quickly comment yeah. on uh, the European perspective, and, and that is that I think very little work on the hydrodynamic side has been done um, before the development of the farms. And we just happened to have some data that was collected by accident um, through some of these farm sites uh, before they were built. And it's been extremely useful in trying to assess some of the changes and how you can disentangle them from the natural variability. So um, this is something that's been found to be really important actually for the hydrodynamics. Yeah. Okay. Great, thank you. Our next question is, what is the distance uh, from the turbine that you anticipate potential effects? How far away would a turbine need to be to have minimal or no effect? Okay, so we don't have any numbers in our report that would address something like that. Um, what we can do is point to some modeling studies and some uh, observations that have been done for European waters 
and wind farms in European waters that might provide some guidance on this. But, um, but you know, we we don't have, a, a, we can't really give a number. The other thing is uh, the natural state of the system, the physical oceanography, the stratification. As we talked about in the presentation, there are a lot of physical processes that go on that vary seasonally and interannually, and that's going to have an effect on the on the impact. Um, but I'll I'll hand this off to Jeff or Josh perhaps to maybe expand on that. But. Or not, maybe. Yeah, I, I, I can I can just add that the conditions that that dictate the the distance and effect might go are dependent on atmospheric and ocean setup. So if you have different marine layer characteristics, it may drive the wakes. I think one of the important things that the committee considered, and, and we got some great input from the community on this, is, is when you think about the wake effect, thinking about the wake effect at the ocean surface, not at the hub height. Mm -hmm. And so understanding how that extraction of energy at hub height um, is actually manifested down at the surface of the ocean. And, and as we say in the report, uh, many of that, many of the results um, relevant to this question are based on modeling studies that are not grounded in a lot of observations. Uh, and so the result is quite ranging. The reason why we couldn't put a number in wasn't because we didn't want to, um, but the scientific literature did not really afford us the opportunity to put a number because the results were quite widely ranged. And so it, it stresses the importance of our recommendation to have uh, grounding in observations uh, to understand uh, how we might quantify the, the length scale of that effect. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Jeff, please. Yeah. I think also it's important to keep in mind that there's, there's going to be a range of scales that are always present with the variability in them due to both the atmospheric alterations as well as the oceanic ones. So uh, it's not just a simple matter of there's an optimal scale or I think it's you really have to think in terms of a spectrum of different scales. All right. Yeah, thank you. And and Doug, please. Yeah. Yeah, just briefly to support those things. I think that it's also quite evident in the report that it's it's the larger scale that we're that we think is is really highly impacted by the climatic changes. And and so even uh changes induced by the turbines at those scales is going to be undetectable. Yeah. Thank you. Our next question is, were impacts of individual wind farms evaluated at multiple scales or were multiple adjacent wind farms like we see in southern New England evaluated by the committee? <clears throat> All right, so the our evaluation was based on the three scales I showed in the report. All right, and um, and one could argue that the large area of um, adjacent wind farms is really just a big wind farm scale that we used in the report, but I think. Um, yeah, we weren't looking at, if I understand this, individual wind farms at multiple scales. We were just looking at the effects at our three basic scales, which was the turbine, the wind farm scale, and a regional scale. But perhaps someone else can provide a more satisfactory answer to that question. Yeah, I, go ahead, Josh, please. I don't want to presume it'll be more satisfactory. <laughs> I mean, I thought you gave a good answer there. Um, yeah. But the one thing I'll say is that it was clear to the committee when we were starting to look at the literature and, and hear from some of the presentations that we had in our public meetings, um, the importance to to factor our, or to categorize our analysis within different scales, um, that you couldn't look at this. And, and I think Jeff just hit on it really well in the mm -hmm. prior answer about the spectrum of scales. I like that term, Jeff. I'm going to use yeah. that. Um, but that, you know, so, so our intention here was to think about the order one categories of scale, which is an individual turbine, a collection of turbines, which we frame out as a wind energy area, the wind energy area to Eileen's point could be 
one project or multiple adjacent projects, but it's it's a collection of turbines. And then there's the larger regional scale, which is beyond the scale of, of development and, and considering that. So we didn't get into the specifics of, of what turbines or what spacing or anything like that, but it was just more a way for us to take an order one because the modeling tools, the literature, all could be categorized into those those broad scales um, and help us in our an analysis and, and recommendations. Yeah, thank you. A much more coherent answer, thank you. Yeah. Great, our next question is, can the committee discuss the difference between water depths in the EU and that of the shoal? Does deeper water mitigate the potential impact? Okay, I think I'll ask maybe Jeff if you want to potentially answer that and others can add to that, I think, if you don't mind. Okay, I can maybe make just a couple comments on that. I don't know how well I can do, but um, I think one thing that you have to keep in mind with deeper water is that as you go into deeper water, you have um, you usually have less of an influence of bottom friction and tidal friction on the stratification. So you're likely to find stronger stratification in deeper water. That's certainly the case in European waters. Um, and so the impacts on stratification are also likely to be less on average, um, but it depends a little bit, I think, on how you measure that. I'm talking more specifically about the direct ocean wakes uh, rather than the atmospheric impacts. Um, in terms of the atmospheric impacts, well, maybe cows can do this better, but I think uh, the deep water shouldn't have such a big effect on, say, the displacement of the thermoclines that you would see. Yeah. Anyone else want to comment on this? No? Yeah, I mean, just, just briefly, I think it's, you know, directly the, to the question about the, the, the chain, the differences in depth between, between the North Sea and the other EU uh, areas in the shoal, it's important for folks to understand that uh, for the fixed foundations, which is what we're discussing, all of them occur in 60 meters or less of water. Once it gets more than that, it moves to floating floating wind uh, turbines, which have a uh, different structure to them. But but I think you know, we're, we're, we're just looking at 60 meters and less. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, go ahead, Richard, please. And keep in mind that none of this was actually on the shoal. This is actually in the deeper water to the west of Nantucket Shoals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. Thank you. Okay. Thank all right. you all. And uh, we just have a few more minutes left here today. So I want to invite uh, the committee members that were able to join us today um, to offer anything that they would want to highlight that hasn't been uh, addressed yet. The report was just released on Friday morning, so folks haven't maybe had a chance to read the whole thing. And so if there's anything that you would like to make sure that uh, people know about as they begin to dig deeper into the report. Okay, so I'll, Richard, you have your hand up to. Yeah, just one real quick comment, and this is, it goes to, back to what Aaron was saying earlier, that most of these projects are focused on monitoring the impact of of actually building it there is not a lot of emphasis on monitoring afterwards and i think implicitly much of our concern here is the long-term effect of what these turbines could be doing to the hydrodynamics of the nantucket shoals region so that argues for a long-term monitoring program beyond the actual construction because that's where for these for right whales and most of the other species that live there that's where the effects are going to occur Thank right. you. Yeah, very good point. Thank you. Yes, Aaron. I'll just add to that a little bit. Um, I've seen some recommendations that monitoring around turbines go on for something like three years after construction. Um, and right whale habitat use is variable on annual and even decadal time scales, and that's really well documented. So the way that right whales may be using the Nantucket Shoals region or not can be completely different from how they are using it 5, 10, 15 years down the line. So 
just think about that. It's not just about how the dynamics are happening in the water around the, the turbine itself, but it's also how right whales and their use of other foraging habitats is impacting their need or not to use this Nantucket Shoals region. So long-term monitoring from the higher trophic level perspective is really um, important. Good. Yeah, Josh and then Doug, yeah. Yeah, I'll just say real briefly, I hope that uh, what comes across in the report is that there is a uh, rich set of knowledge of the hydrodynamics of this region and other regions that are that are being considered for offshore wind development. Um, I encourage everyone to review Glenn Gorkowitz's presentation that was made to the committee. Mm -hmm. Really nice job of summarizing. It's based on a lot of peer-reviewed science, peer-reviewed data, um, and that it's important as we think about impacts um, that as the report recommends, that we consider uh, monitoring and research studies that really try and isolate that impact amidst all that we already know about the hydrodynamics. And so I hope that that's a message that comes from the report. Right. Thank you. And Doug, maybe you're the last comment here. Yeah. Oh, boy, that's dangerous. <laughs> Thanks, Eileen. Uh, I just yeah. wanted to reiterate something you did. You did cover uh, nicely in the presentation, but it, there's so much in there that it. it uh, um, I just wanted to reiterate, and that is that the importance for people to understand that this, this zooplankton population that the right whales may be feeding on is not created on the shoals or in that area. It is um, vected in um, from from the larger Gulf of Maine and, and North Atlantic. And I would point everyone to Andy Pershing's presentation to the committee um, to to explore that. And it's the, the supply of copepods is really the important uh, part and out the production. Thanks. Right. It's a good point. And thank you for, for bringing that up again. Maybe Jeff, you can be the last comment here, please. It's not a scientific one, actually. Yeah. Uh, it's more of an administrative one. Uh, there's a lot of questions in the chat that we didn't get to. I was just wondering um, what we do about those since we're out of time, I think. Yeah. So thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah. We definitely did not have enough time for how many questions there are. Um, Kelly Osvig, who was the study director for this study, has dropped her email in the chat um, for everyone. So if you have further questions about the study today or in the coming weeks and months, um, we encourage you to reach out to Kelly and she can direct those questions uh, to the, the appropriate expert um, as they come in. So thank you for the administrative question, yeah. Jeff. Um, and yeah, like like Eileen has said, we're we're at the end of our time. So I want to thank all of our committee members for their time volunteering to write the report, um, as well as today for joining us on this webinar. Uh, I also want to thank all of you for joining us and all of your fantastic questions. Um, as I mentioned in my introduction, a recording of this webinar will be available in the coming weeks on the National Academy's webpage. And as you exit this webinar, you should be redirected to the report page where you can access um, all the materials associated with this report. So again, thank you all for joining us and I hope you have a great rest of your Monday. Yeah, and I'd like to add my thanks to the committee and also to the audience for today. So thank you all. <laughs>